let's bring in Jeff. Uh, Jeff, how far do you think I can throw a football? Oh, it's bringing the heat right off the top here. Huh? Mm-hmm. Hard hitting questions. You strike me as a guy that would sort of look for the safety valve coming out of the backfield. You know, just That's right. the, yeah, a little swing pass. Correct as always, Jeff. Transcendent analysis. Jeff, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, it's been a fun season, guys. Thanks. Yeah, it's been a fun season. Uh, it was a fun season until last night, Jeff. And in all seriousness, obviously, it has been good. And it came to a conclusion last night. Just your thoughts on the Canucks in Game 7. Yeah, I mean, that game looked a lot like a lot of the games in the playoffs where even though they were down, they weren't out. And, and it is an admirable quality. I just think you're playing with fire. If you're constantly chasing games, you're not always going to come back. And even though they chipped away, you know, they had a couple of miraculous comebacks in the playoffs and those were amazing. And that gave them this confidence that they were still in the hockey game, even though they've been outshot 22 to four at one point. But it's just the math. It's hockey math that if you're down and trailing, going to the third period, the numbers tell you, you might come back sometimes, but you're not coming back as often as you would like. And I guess when I look at game six, the opportunity was there to punt the Oilers from the playoffs and they missed. And we came out of that game and said like, all right, you know, 17 shots on or 15 shots on Stuart Skinner, not enough, you know, passive game plan, sat back, all those types of things. Surely they're not going to do the same thing in game seven. And, and then game seven looked an awful lot like game six did. So, you know, there's so many ways to come at it. You guys have touched on a number of things. Uh, I, I look at a missed opportunity and that Connor McDavid, in my mind, was probably the fourth best oiler in that series. Certainly was the fourth most productive oiler. Like Connor McDavid didn't beat the Vancouver Canucks, and that feels like opportunity squandered. Now, other guys obviously stepped up. You talked about Bouchard. The Nuge came on and ended up having a, a, a strong series, and he scores the game winner uh, on the power play in the second period there. But it wasn't McDavid. Dreisaitl was a horse throughout, but McDavid didn't look 100%. I'm not sure that he's 100%. And I thought that, you know, if they held him in check, which they did for the most part, he had two big games and otherwise was pretty quiet. I thought that would play in the Canucks' favor. It didn't. Um, You know, we watched this Canucks team, guys, all season long, but certainly since the All-Star break, something turned uh, with the way that they approached games, the way that they tried to win with defense rather than offense. Uh, didn't score nearly as much in the second half of the season as they did in the first half. And the power play was a huge part of that. And, you know, for me, the power play at the outset of the series, I I thought like that may single-handedly win this thing for the Edmonton Oilers. It didn't. The Oilers scored twice as many power play goals as the Canucks did. In the end, they scored six to the Canucks three. It's not the six though at all that we're talking about. It's the three for the Vancouver Canucks and the fact that they didn't score a power play goal over the final four games. So, you know, in some ways it was kind of fitting that the winning goal of the series was a power play goal for the Oilers because the Canucks had more power plays. They had 23 to the Oilers 20. And I think people feared so much made about the officiating and, you know, this vaunted Oiler power play. In the end, the Canucks ended up with more power plays and situational power plays when you think of the double minor to Evander Kane in game number four. The early penalties to Dreisaitl and McDavid in game six, the five on three and a chance to get back into game six, even though they were being outplayed. And then last night, the McLeod double minor in the first period when the Canucks were being skated circles around. And that was this little glimmer of hope was, all right, you've withstood this storm. Here's your power play opportunity. Do something with it. And the power play last night in the first period may have looked as bad as it did at any point this season in crunch time with the chance to open the scoring and just put all the pressure on the Edmonton Oilers. And it was ghastly. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. The entries, uh, the lack thereof. I I mean, I joked on Twitter that it it felt like the Canucks got to the Oilers blue line and then asked for permission to come in. Um, (laughs) And the Oilers were like, get out of here. Um, You know, credit to the Oilers uh, and their coaching staff. Like they made adjustments. They, pressured the Canucks at every turn and Rick Tockett said meet pressure with pressure all season and they they wilted uh, under the pressure of the Oilers penalty kill uh, late in this series so they went over their final 10 in this game that was just or the series that was so tight and power play a power play goal here or there could have swung this thing and I think that's where I look at this is you know would they advance would they put up a challenge against a team like the Dallas Stars who knows that's not really the issue here it's the 
they played all season to get a, a game seven on home ice and they just did nothing with it until it was too late. So that was the disappointment, but I love the reaction from the fan base at the end and the salute. And you heard the players and how emotional they were uh, after the game about the loss, but also just this reconnection with the fan base. That is one of the true storylines to come out of uh, what was a great 82 game regular season and 13 fun uh, drama field games in the postseason. I want to go a little deeper on the power play there because this isn't just a case of, oh, it went, oh, it went out in the series from the all-star break till the end of the regular season. Vancouver's power play ranked 24th in the NHL. It was a major question mark and something that we discussed a lot heading into the playoffs. And for the postseason as a whole, it clicked at 13.9%, which a 13.9% rate in the regular season would have ranked 31st in the NHL. So this is something that's been an issue for a while here. Do you think when you reflect on the power play struggles, how much of it do you think is an X's and O's aspect where the coaching staff can maybe address this, make adjustments in the off season and that this group has it within themselves or how much of it do you think is also just personnel wise? Maybe they're missing a piece or two. Well, I think first and foremost, Harm, I, I want them to acknowledge that it was an issue that all those things that you just said, I found far too often when players were asked about it, they got frustrated being asked about the struggles of the power play and kind of swept it aside. And it's the ebbs and flows and Quinn's the captain, but he was also the leader of this. Oh, it'll be all right. Things are going to be fine. In the end, it wasn't fine. And so I think to correct a problem, you have to acknowledge that one exists and maybe they'll all sit back and watch the tape of this uh, show. They can, play it in the dressing room before they do their exit meetings. And, uh, you know, they have to, like, they've got a huge staff. They, uh, they know the numbers, but they have to be willing to accept and acknowledge that the numbers were what the numbers were because they didn't execute. Uh, you know, I, way too much perimeter passing. Uh, one of the things about that Euler power play wasn't the execution and ultimately it was the goals. It was when they didn't score, it was how relentless they were to go get the puck and started over again until they did score. And I never really got that feeling with the Canucks. There was just way too much one and done. Guys didn't seem to want to be the first to the puck on the boards. Puck retrieval is a huge part of the power play. It's not a sexy part, but if you can keep it in zone and, and regroup and start it over instead of going back to your own end and collecting the puck, I mean, that's, you know, 20 seconds. It's more opportunities. And just, again, there's too much talent individually. I mean, when the Canucks had Besser in the lineup and Lindholm was there, like every guy on that first unit went to the all-star weekend. Like it's undeniable how much talent they had on the ice. And at times it looked like these guys didn't understand the very concept of a man advantage that they had one more guy out there than the other team. And that, like, it, it just, it was so frustrating, especially in crunch time. So I do wonder like uh, an NHL head coach has so much on his plate now. And Rick Tockett is huge on committees. But I do wonder if this was ultimately a failed experiment that they have to designate a power play coach and entrust him and empower him to come up with some new looks, some new schemes, some, you know, some better breakouts, whatever the case. I, I just don't think that saying, oh, yeah, we've got lots of guys with NHL experience on the staff, you know, that's going to be fine. No, I mean, this is now a game of specialties and every inch that you can gain on an opponent uh, can work in your favor. And I, I do think that it's probably in the, I, I'm curious to see if that's something the Canucks would consider, you know, whether it's a personnel change, whether it's going outside the organization and bringing in a special teams coach or a power play coach, or whether they think they have the right person in the organization, but just put him in charge of that portfolio because ultimately uh, it was costly at the end, and a power play goal here or there in Game 4 or Game 6 or Game 7 absolutely could have swung this thing in the Vancouver Canucks' favor. I think that's what made it so frustrating is Edmonton clearly was way more aggressive on the penalty kill, but when teams do that, like it's not the first time we've seen that done in the NHL. When teams do that, if you can get the puck around that first charging guy, you should have a numbers mismatch that you can really take advantage of, and the Canucks just... The Canucks just withered away on every zone entry, and it was it was it was tough to watch, uh, as you said there, as you said, Jeff. Um, looking at the goaltending of that series, Archer Shelovs was phenomenal. Obviously, the Canucks didn't test Stuart Skinner enough in Game Six or Seven. Uh, what do you make of what we saw from Shelovs, and 
Like, is there any question in your mind that he's the backup next year? Yeah, I mean, that's going to be one of my favorite storylines to come out of these playoffs. I mean, this guy got absolutely thrown into it, uh, it being the pressure cooker, uh, you know, in Nashville, on the road. His first start was a an overtime game that ultimately the Canucks took care of early, and so he didn't have to face the rigors of overtime in his Stanley Cup debut, but it was a tight game, obviously, right down to the end. Uh, and then to post a shutout and an elimination game against the Predators and then face the best players on the planet seven games in a row – uh, and hold his own. That first period last night, the Kulak save, the Connor Brown breakaway. Uh, however, he trapped that puck from Dreisaitl on the second period. That save, too. You know, again, you, you wanted this team to feed off some of that. And it just it took until far too late to get the kick in the pants that they needed. But my goodness, uh, Artur Silovs, uh, the pink shirt, uh, will remember that for a while, too. Um, you just love how playoff the playoff stage can present an opportunity for guys to elevate and sort of, you know, rise above. And he did just that. So uh, really when you go back to last season and his uh, first look in the national hockey league, didn't look out of place, got the four games this year where they turned to him uh, home game against Vegas where he gave up an early one, but uh, then locked it down. Like, you know, this guy has just shown a ton of character and yeah, I mean, it feels to me like his time has come to be a national hockey leaguer. Obviously, they've got decisions. He needs a contract here in the offseason. So, you know, there's some moving parts still, but uh, it would feel to me like it'd be in the best interest of the hockey club if they were to come back with Thatcher Demko and Arthur Silovs as their two goaltenders. Like, I'm totally in favor now of putting a cap on Demko's regular season starts, and it's probably at 50 games. Um, you know, it, it just, he hasn't shown here for the last three years that he can get through a season unscathed and now he's coming off uh, consecutive knee injuries and you know he'll have the off season to uh, rehab and get ready but uh, I think it's time to reduce his workload and put a, a hard number on it and have somebody that's capable of stepping in and handling those other games and those minutes and even if they're games that you think you'd like your number one you know Arthur Shalaz has shown here that uh, he can handle the pressure and he's up to the challenge and he gives his team a chance to win so yes the Canucks had to push through these playoffs without their star goaltender but a star emerged and goaltending really wasn't, you know, much of an issue. Uh, there was plenty of goaltending there for the Vancouver Canucks to uh, knock this Edmonton team out. And unfortunately, they had two chances and just could not deliver in game six or seven. So uh, I hope for Artie's sake that uh, he's a full-time NHLer. I think he's earned that opportunity now. Last night, Connor Garland almost single-handedly brought the Canucks back into the fight. He was one of the only players that seemed to have jump all night. What did you learn about his character and his ability to, to continue uh, being a force in a playoff environment, despite being a smaller guy? And in contrast, when I look at Dakota Joshua, I'm curious what you thought of his playoffs, because on paper, you look at it and you go, four goals and eight points in 13 games, like not bad, but it sort of felt like, only nine shots on goal in the entire playoffs. It, it almost felt like he wasn't really um, as noticeable as uh, the point totals might suggest. Yeah, and I think, you know, Garland, obviously three years here in Vancouver, I got so locked on to his goal totals in the early going and had expectations for a guy that had been a 20-plus goal scorer in Arizona uh, and thought, why isn't this happening? Has he been a disappointment? Uh, you know, I, and I'm not alone. I think my views of him changed a lot this year just in terms of him driving play and the motor always running and winning his more than his share of puck battles. I, I still am amazed how often he would come out uh, against much bigger guys, uh, traffic along the wall, a pile, and <laughs> here would come number eight, and he'd have the puck on his stick, and, um, you know, no quit. So I'm not surprised that he was the guy ultimately that kind of started the comeback uh, for his sake and the team's sake. I wish it had started earlier, uh, but you could just never question his effort Uh 82 games and, and 13 here in the playoffs. So uh, a ton of respect for, you know, playoff hockey is not easy, uh, even for the guys that are physically built for it. Uh, but little guys, uh, they've got to rise above. And and he did. And on the flip side there, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Dakota Joshua, like I think six of his eight points came in two games. I think he had two three-point games. Yeah. And talk about a guy that looks the part of being built for playoff hockey, I, I would put him in the disappointing category. And I know he led the team in hits, but... I have a hard time remembering a lot of his hits. The ones I do remember resulted in penalties uh, in the Nashville series. And I, I don't know. I just, like, yes, it's great that he's finishing checks, but you got to make those, not every body check is equal at playoff time. And for a guy of his stature, like, I, I wanted to believe he could leave more of a mark. So 
Um, when he was good, he was good, but there were too many moments where his play either plateaued or dipped. And, you know, he's another guy that it's all part of this learning experience that I, I do believe that they'll be better for it. Um, but, you know, ultimately, like if they ran out of gas, and I'm not just saying to go to Joshua, I'm just saying as a team, if they ran out of gas, they had seven wins here this spring. You need 16 to win the Stanley Cup. And I just think that's a reminder of, you know, as much ground as they've covered as an organization and putting the respect back on the crest, as Rick Tockett talked about, there is still a, a long way to, to traverse here before they are legitimate, true legitimate Stanley Cup contenders. And I know they were a win away from being part of the Final Four, but, uh, you know, this is a team that obviously was lacking uh, top six scoring depth, uh, certainly you know, even before Brock Besser came out for game seven. That's something that has to be addressed here. Uh, and there were a handful of guys. So, like Dakota Joshua was, uh, yeah, underwhelming. You know, Pia Suter was a, a decent piece in the regular season playing with Miller and Besser in the playoffs. He was pretty quiet. I mean, yes, he had the big moment in game six against Nashville, but uh, you know, you're playing that high in the lineup. I think it's uh, fair to have some expectations that there's going to be a little bit more. I think he had one assist in the Edmonton series and it just was way too quiet. Uh, you know, there were others. Like, those are a couple of names right off the top of, of mind here. But, uh, yeah, like, you know, seven wins, 13 games. It was a blast. It was a great ride. But don't lose sight of the fact that those next nine wins that you ultimately need, uh, they're that much more difficult. And if this team ran out of gas, then they have to sort of look at it through that prism and figure out how do you get from here uh, to there. Jeff, kind of in that same line of thinking, availabilities are the end of this week and management we're expecting is going to speak either Friday or Monday. Other than owning up to the power play being a bit of an issue, what are you hoping to hear at these availabilities at the end of the season? I, I mean, I do hope some of the players uh, are honest with their physical limitations here in the playoffs. Like, I, I am curious after the fact, you know, uh, nobody can target them in the offseason. So I do hope, like, it's not an excuse, but it is an explanation if a guy is playing through a significant injury. And that's part of, you know, the battle of attrition here. And if you're Quinn Hughes, you were targeted, uh, rightly so. I mean, a 92-point Norris Trophy winning defenseman, of course the other team is going to try to pay special attention. But I heard you guys talking about that. 13 playoff games. I don't think I left the building once thinking, oh yeah, Quinn Hughes was the best player on the ice on either team. Yep. And yet I, I bet I walked out of Rogers Arena 20 times during the regular season and it was just no doubt. And so, um, you know, what does he learn about what it's going to take to withstand the physical attention that comes with being a, a superstar defenseman in the National Hockey League? I mean, there's been so much speculation about PD and what he's played through. Uh, again, I mean, it was a dreadful playoff. We know that. But maybe he can shed some light now on some of the challenges that were holding him back. Because if he sits there and tells us, I was 100%, felt never felt better, that's a, that's a massive <laughs> red flag so i hope for his sake that uh, he shows up in a in a body cast or something that you know would explain uh, a little bit more so uh you know some of that that can just help us uh, fill in some of the blanks about uh, the shortcomings of this hockey club ultimately though you know again i thought guys spoke from the heart it was eloquent last night uh you know garland was almost moved to tears jt miller this big tough alpha male uh you know he had to gather himself a couple of times just talking about the fan response, not just at the end of the game as they saluted the fans one final time, but, you know, this is a fan base that, uh, you know, chants JT's name with regularity now. When you think of where he was a couple of years ago and the 180 just in terms of the buy-in from the market for this guy, uh, it does feel like we're on the precipice of hopefully something special, but I'm also drawn to the end of the bubble playoffs where, you know, Pedersen and Hughes and Bo Horvat at that time and others – really their first taste to playoff hockey and they all excelled and we were all so excited in this market like they were one of the sexy teams in the national hockey league coming out of the bubble took vegas to a seventh game and then we all know what happened on that thanksgiving weekend um, calendar was tilted back then but that was free agency you know markstrom and tanov and stetcher and Toffoli all walked out the door cost cutting and covid set this organization back and it sort of feels like we're you know back in that mode a little bit where uh, there were some real things to build on out of this playoff performance, but now with the new management group, there's also some really daunting questions facing this organization about moving forward and, and 
who do you keep and who do you walk away from and at what price points and all those types of things. I have a lot more faith in this management group than the one that ultimately allowed far too many free agents just to walk out the door. Uh, but I do think that there is some similarities to where the organization was coming out of the bubble in 2020 to where it is here and the path now that it has to plot moving forward. Lots of decisions. It's a bit of a crossroads. And of course, Jeff, we'll be talking to you all off season long. We'll get, we'll give you a break at some point, I think, but uh, we always appreciate you chatting with us and thanks all season long. Uh, you've been crushing it obviously over at Canucks army and rink wide Vancouver, and especially on our show and you do these hits. So we appreciate it, Jeff. Thanks for doing this. Well, it's always fun. Tuesday's uh, one of the highlights being on with you guys. And uh, yeah, it's been fun to be uh, under the Nation Network umbrella all season long. And I kind of feel like we're just getting started here. So already looking forward to, to next season. Yeah, looking forward to it. It's going to be good. Look at that beautiful backdrop behind Jeff. Property and Nation Network. Rink wide, Canucks arm. Look at that. Wow. Love it. Jeff, thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.